This should be tape number one. Say tape number one. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this local area. The National Farmers Organization takes great pride in inventing a marketing system to meet the needs of the 20th century, collective bargaining for agriculture. NFO represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers. U.S. Farm Report presents Responsible Action with the moderator Ed Shima and our guest, the Reverend E.W. Mueller, a staff member of the Department of Church and Community Planning, the Lutheran Council in the United States of America, Chicago. Welcome to another edition of U.S. Farm Report. Before we get into today's, to, into today's program, I think I should explain real briefly the reason for the NFO. The uh, NFO basically proposes to improve farmers' income through collective bargaining and contract marketing. The uh, reason for this is that uh, farmers' income over the years has been consistently lower than the uh, income of the rest of the people in our uh, society and economy. Uh, currently, the uh, parity ratio stands at about 74% of parity, which is uh, a pitifully low level. The uh, average income of uh, farmers compared to non-farmers is about two-thirds as much. I think these two things in themselves they explain quite uh, vividly the reason for the NFO and uh, the reason for our trying to improve our bargaining power. And uh, on today's program, I'd like to at this point introduce uh, Reverend E.W. Mueller, who is uh, with the Department of Church and Community Planning of the Lutheran Council in the uh, USA, and he's headquartered at uh, Chicago. Uh, today's uh, program, we will go into somewhat the, the uh, responsibility of the individual in his community in terms of uh, improving his uh, economic lot, the, uh, the various uh, religious, social uh, aspects of this, and so on. Uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, turn to Reverend Mueller and uh, ask him uh, the reason that he is uh, interested in uh, this basic issue and, uh, and some of the uh, ideas that he has in terms of improving it. Reverend Mueller. Well, I have been working in the area of the church and the town and country for about 20 years, and I'm very much concerned about uh, the improvement of the total quality of the rural living. And we know that uh, unless the uh, countryside is in a sound rural economy, we cannot make much progress in any area of life. And so we're very much concerned about uh, imp improvement that various people are trying to bring about. And uh, we're for the advancement of, of the uh, modern America, modern rural America. And I think uh, people can do something about it. Uh, in terms of uh, improving the general situations, what are some of the uh, things that uh, individual people would need to do uh, along this line? Well, I think the first thing, people need to recognize their own responsibility, that uh, things are the way they are, not just because of sin some sinister force, or some outside enemy that has done this, it often is the result of uh, the lack of responsibility that we have accepted. And uh, I would like to sort of quote Thomas Paine here, that people have the power to uh, begin the world over again. And I would say that rural people can rebuild rural America if uh, they put their mind to it. What are some of the basic principles that you feel they would need to follow in doing this, Reverend Mueller? Well, I would like to identify three basic ifs uh, that we might discuss. I think that rural America can, that people in rural America can rebuild the countryside if they will dedicate themselves to basic values or basic goals, and if they will repent of irresponsible individualism, and if they will regroup their forces. Well, this uh, word irresponsible uh, individualism sort of uh, 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 is an impressive uh, sounding thing. Would you care to elaborate on that somewhat more? Yes, uh, we, uh, we're for individualism, and, but I think when we have, over we have sometimes overemphasized it. And rugged individualism as an end in itself can be harmful. I would say we are probably, there are two basic diseases 
that sort of plagues society today. And the one disease is referred to as collectivism. This we have in some of the communistic countries, where the group is overemphasized and where the individual no longer counts. And so the, uh, as a result, community disintegrates because the individual is uh, robbed of his own individual significance and his own individual decision making. And uh, this is a disease that hurts uh, the community development. Now, rugged individualism is quite different, yet it's uh, quite a different disease, but it has the same effect it tends to disintegrate community because it overemphasizes the importance of the individual and uh, destroys the group. Now, I think what we need here, we want strong individuals, people who think for themselves, who are in the position to make choices, but they need to be, they must also have the capacity to meaningfully relate to the group and, uh, and to be a part of the group. And they need some basic goals then to follow also. Yes, they need some basic goals to, to follow, and uh, they uh, need to uh, be aware that they cannot achieve these goals by themselves. See? The, uh, we're in a quite different situation than we were years ago, particularly farming. We're no longer in a period of agrarianism. See? When the farmer made his own uh, linen, turned his own butter, and uh, produced his own meat, and milk and so forth, and his own fuel for, uh, for uh, like oats for, for the horses, then he was pretty independent. But today the farmer is no longer independent. About 70% of the things that he needs on his farm he buys. Therefore he is quite dependent, and therefore he can't just go alone. And we are in an age of groupism, or organization. And if, and it's this rugged individualism, which I think has sort of hindered the farmer, or rural people, not just the farmer, but rural people, mm -hmm. from really zeroing in on their problem. And they have looked perhaps sometimes too much to government for the answer. But I think the answer really relies with themselves, if they can take this rug individualism in tow. I'd like to refer to it sometimes as self-centeredness, see? And self-centeredness is a basic sin, see? Because it tends to put us, or the individual, the I, in the center of things, rather than being concerned about being a meaningful, having a meaningful relationship to the rest of society. Now, if, uh, uh, rather than being too individualistic, uh, as uh, maybe some uh, farmers or people are, if they would uh, uh, group together more in terms of group action, what are some of the uh, benefits they could uh, receive from this over the uh, pattern they have today? Well, if they would uh, group together and work together, then they could achieve whatever desired goals they have. Now, they'd have to determine what the desired goals are. For example, I would say they are justified at present in their complaint that they're not being adequately rewarded for their input of capital and labor in the farm enterprise. Mm -hmm. I think this is a well-known fact. Now, I don't think they can solve this unless they are willing to work together. See? But here again, they have a basic problem. And this is what I like to call is the lack of commitment. The, uh, I think the farmer or rural people in general find it difficult to make a commitment to a group and to stick with this commitment even when group interest is contrary to self-interest for the immediate moment. And because they don't make this commitment, it's difficult really to get a strong organization. And uh, the, to, to get this commitment, they have to be aware that they have to stick with it even sometimes when it, when it hurts. Then uh, I suppose that this is something that uh, farmers have sort of grown up with uh, over the generations that they would, uh, that they have been sort of taught and because of necessity had to be rugged individualist. And this probably uh, in today's uh, uh, organized economy and so on in society, this uh, sort of creates a problem then. Now he tends to look back. He tends to look back, and uh, it was a day when he was quite independent, and, and uh, I don't want to be misunderstood here that I'm for independent decision, independent choices, mm -hmm. but he has to be willing to think in terms of uh, working with other people. And here he must be willing to take some risk. And uh, marketing associations aren't new. We've had them for years. Remember, we had them way back when my father was on the farm. 
But, uh, however, on the other hand, the behavior of people was this way. If, I, if they belonged to a certain marketing association, and then through a, uh, another association or another marketing uh, structure, they could get a one-fourth of a cent more for their product, they would desert their own association in the interest of that one-fourth cent. Mm -hmm. In other words, they were asserting their individualism, so to speak, in those circumstances, to right. their detriment. To their own detriment. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to recognize you cannot have a strong countryside or a strong society unless we pay adequate attention to two factors, the importance of the individual see, and the importance of the group. And that we need to keep a balance between the importance of the individual and the importance of the group. Mm -hmm. Now, interest groups, on the other hand, and the farm organization may be an interest group. Interest groups have to remember that they are not the nation, see, and that they can't put, push their interests to the detriment see, of the total nation. Mm -hmm. They have a right to push their interests, you see, when, uh, as long as it's equitable and just. See. But the moment they push their individual interests to the hurt of the nation, then they are damaging the group. Now, uh, at this point in our uh, society and so on, we've seen uh, various uh, social groups, uh, organized uh, religious uh, groups, and political groups, and so on. At this point, uh, of course, we have farm organizations, but as such, farmers have not organized economically very much at this point. And uh, wh what do you attribute this to? Well, I would say they have organized. We've had farm organization, and every crisis seems to, or every war seems to give us a new farm organization, see? Mm -hmm. But uh, I, was re I was referring to farm organizations that uh, dealt in the economics of farming or the uh, selling of their products. There been, uh, no one has really zeroed in, I would say, until now NFO has zeroed in on really trying to get the farmer a better price. Mm -hmm. There have been many farm organizations that have done good work and they have worked for better legislation, they have worked for better programs, they have developed cooperatives to help the farmer to, be, uh, to buy in the to get a better buy for the things that he, that he buys. But I think the, uh, the real weak point has been that no one really has helped him of put him into a position that uh, he could put a price tag on human effort that's expended. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one reason why, uh, why, why we have the problem that we do have. Because young people, they are free. They're not tied to the rural America and they will go where they can get the best return for the human effort that they spend. And, uh, and unless we can, in rural America, can put an adequate price tag on human effort, rural America is always going to decline. Uh, at this point, uh, in, uh, it would seem then that these people have, uh, uh, rather than to move ahead in terms of uh, improving their economic situation, have, uh, have not made a commitment to any group of people and so on in terms of improving this situation. Is this basically right then? This is right. And uh, they had not stuck with it. And this is why I am saying, and I would say to you, and I say to your organization, or to any organization, I don't care who, who the organization you belong to, if you want that organization to do something for you, then stick with it. See? And uh, for the moment, sacrifice your self-interest in order that you may, as a group, act responsibly and achieve responsible things. At this point, I'd just like to move into the other if, if I may, okay. from the standpoint of we ought to have some, some dedicate ourselves to basic goals, to basic values. And the, what I want to emphasize here, we ought to remember that man is a steward of God's creation. And when we say on Sunday, which most of the churches confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, we are saying that this is not our world, this is God's world. And therefore, we are responsible for what we do in God's world, how we manage God's world. And we must be responsible stewards and workmen that need not be ashamed. And as a, as a farmer needs to understand the soil and be a good steward of the soil, he also needs to develop other structures in order that he may fulfill his responsibility as an individual and as a member of a group. For example, we didn't conserve too much soil until we developed the Soil Conservation District. There were many individual farmers who had an interest in soil conservation before the district, but not until they developed a structure through which they could express their group action to we achieve anything. And the same thing I would say is in the area of, uh, of, uh, of marketing. 
We need to develop structures so that the farmer can really express himself and achieve his goal. Now, I'm a, a consumer that lives in the Chicago area. I would like to give the farmer more for his milk, see? but I just can't go to the store and say, well, now the farmer isn't getting enough. I want to give the storekeeper two cents more for a quart. No, I can't do this until the farmers themselves develop some kind of a marketing structure by means of which they ask for this, you see. This uh, then uh, brings up the question of, uh, as far as the individual is concerned, uh, he probably uh, would need to change his attitude just a little bit in terms of uh, the direction he's heading. And what would you say would be some of the more important points on this, Reverend Mueller? Well, I think, I think he has to be concerned for other people. You know, uh, we have, uh, this again might refer to rugged individualism, but uh, just from a little different angle, is that uh, the, uh, the strong, not all people are created free and equal. All people are equal. And all people have equal worth. But all people don't have the same capability, the same managerial ability. And uh, I think from a Christian standpoint, the strong ought to help the weak, mm -hmm. rather than the strong exploiting the weak. And I would say, here's the way we have to change our attitude. There's a bit of tendency for us, see, for the strong to exploit the weak. Now, we have called this efficiency, and I'm for efficiency, see, to a point. But, but, but when it hurts people, then I think we need to begin to question it. See? And that uh, efficiency as an end in itself can be evil. Actually, uh, for the strong individual that uh, uh, could provide the leadership and the know-how and so on, uh, even uh, rather than exploiting his neighbor to his benefit, if he would work with his neighbor, it'd probably improve him more in the long run. This is right. But instead, what, it, what has happened, he tends to step up his efficiency. See? Mm -hmm. And uh, then the man who is less efficient gets squeezed out. And then it's just a matter of time before it catches up with him. Mm -hmm. This we might refer to as someone has called it the fallacy of composition. See? But this I mean this, you see, is uh, that which is good for the individual farmer may not be good for the farming industry, mm -hmm. for example. So you get more efficient and you do that right away, you'll benefit. But when you all get this way, you're back in the same rut. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, I may go to a football game, and because I'm small of stature, I can't see what's going on, so I get on my tiptoe. Now I can see, see until everybody else gets on their tiptoes. Mm -hmm. And I'm back where I was, you see. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this, uh, so the point is, we have to be, remember that what is good for the farming, individual farmer may not be good for the farming industry. See? And what may be good for me may not be good for my community mm -hmm. and i need to be concerned about my own self-interest this is proper but i also need to be concerned see, about the total community well-being not just the farmers but but the total community now going on to the three basic ifs and uh, i believe your third if is to uh, regroup forces and what would this involve well, the regrouping forces i think this is a, a very important one which we aren't talking haven't said too much about but uh, Rural America has moved into a new era. There was a time when uh, rural America had political power and the uh, majority of people lived in rural areas. This is no longer true. Rural people are a minority. Up until very recently, they were a majority. And now they face the task see, of playing the role of being a responsible minority. And in this role of being a responsible minority, they can't lie upon the farm block or political pressure. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to come up with their own creative ideas and ways of working together. In other words, this would involve uh, uh, setting up a social and economic structure that would, uh, that would uh, do for them the things that they haven't been able to do individually. Right. See? Now, in this, you'll have uh, special interest groups like the farm interest groups, and perhaps some labor interest groups. But uh, there are many more people in rural America than just farmers. For example, if you just take the non-metropolitan county, and by a non-metropolitan county, I mean a county that does not have a city of 50,000 in it, or is not adjacent to a city of 50,000. Now, if you just take the people in the open country and the people in towns up to 10,000 across 
the uh, across America, you'll come up with a total population of about 70 million people. This is what I refer to as the rural sector. Mm -hmm. This rural sector basically is voiceless. See? Now, if the farmers were united in one organization, see, then they would only speak for one-fourth of this rural sector. Mm -hmm. There are the other three-fourths that really aren't organized. But their future and their well-being would infect all the rest right. of them. Right. And it's tied up one with the other. In other words, the farmer uh, has quite a responsibility to the rest of uh, the rural uh, sector and also to the uh, country as a whole. Yes, because for this 70 million people I'm talking about, the farming basically is the economic base. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we are getting some industry into rural areas. This will supplement in part the uh, agricultural uh, base. But by and large, agriculture for this 70 million will remain a very primary economic base. We must find some way for these people to, to work together. Now, looking at this from a moral point of view in setting up uh, the structure that would take to uh, accomplish uh, some of these goals, what would be some of the guidelines that you feel that uh, should be followed? Well, I would say some of the guidelines we should follow here is the fact that the people themselves are put in the position to decide their own future. That, uh, that the planning be done by the people whose lives are going to be affected. And that be not primarily done from people from the outside. Now, for this to happen, the people in the countryside need to get into what I call horizontal dialogue. Most of rural America is, is vertically organized. By this I mean you have uh, the small unit, see? then you have maybe a county unit, then a district unit, then a state unit, then a national unit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so the, the conversation runs from the, from the small to the top. Mm -hmm. But you have little horizontal dialogue. For instance, here is a town over here in a county maybe of a thousand people, and a county over here of a thousand people. And maybe there are other six towns like this in the same county. I would say seldom do the mayors of those towns get together and talk. And by the same token, the uh, farmers in uh, these various counties uh, converse with each other across county lines very little also. And this has been somewhat of a problem. Right. You see, you have, you have, a, you have plenty of organizations. You see, we have so many organizations. But these organizations, whether it's uh, soil conservation, whether it's REA, whether it's farm organizations, whether it's cooperatives, these organizations, instead of them tending to be bridges, see, mm -hmm. to getting into this horizontal dialogue, they tend to be walls see, from, from, from uh, a local point to the national point. Now, we need to think in terms of, of the larger area community. And this is multi-county. Mm -hmm. And if these people begin to think together, then they begin to can regroup their forces, and if they do this, they can reshape their, their destiny. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, uh, as far as uh, these people discussing the various aspects of, of their problems and so on across the county and state lines and so on, do you have any particular guidelines that you think they should follow in terms of setting up a structure uh, or organization and so on? That would be... Uh, no, I think this... Uh, I think the first thing is that people... Leaders. Uh, the le there are leaders there. These leaders should get into uh, uh, conversation with one another. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they should begin to uh, uh, improve their understanding of what is happen happening. They get the facts and information and, uh, and try to identify alternate courses of action. Mm -hmm. What can they do? See? And... Uh, and I would say, here I would say a word for uh, what we call community development. Practically every county has community development now. It's supported by, uh, pushed by extension a good deal. And I would say the other guideline is that the farmers and Main Street have to work together. Traditionally, there's been a, a sort of a feud going on mm -hmm. between the farmers and, and Main Street. The farmer thought the main man on Main Street had it easy, and uh, the... Uh, Man, a fellow Main Street thought that the farm was making a lot of money. Now, their, their future is pretty much tied together. And I would like to say a word here for the fellow on Main Street in the small town. The farmer is hurting, but I would say the man uh, on Main Street, he's also hurting. Mm -hmm. In now, other words, they, they, they need to work together on right. the common problems. Then. Because if we don't, the farmer can always sell his land. 
at a good at a good price. Mm -hmm. But if the economy of the area is not very good, it'll be very difficult for a farmer to sell his lumber yard. Now there's sort of a tendency uh, in uh, visiting with some of the people in the small towns and the farmers around them to not to become involved in any of these issues and and uh, this basically isn't right. What uh, could be done about this? Well, this basically goes back to uh, our tendency not to want to become involved in somebody else's business. Each one sort of for his own. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll use an illustration here to, il to illustrate this point, and I'll probably use it again some other time, but, but uh, let me grammatize it this way. When the country was settled, when the, when the wagon trains moved across Iowa, Nebraska, on west, see, there were some rugged individuals who, uh, who felt, well, I'm not going to wait for the wagon train. See. I'm going to go myself. Mm -hmm. Some made it, but many of them didn't make it. See. Mm -hmm. It was much more responsible action to join up with a wagon train. Mm -hmm. But when you had a wagon train, a very important aspect of the wagon train was the wagon master. See. And the wagon master almost had control over life and death. He's like the captain of a ship. See. Mm -hmm. see. So the farmer, so the man uh, traveling with his wagon, for the moment gave up some individual freedom in the interest of gaining group strength to achieve his goal. And I think this, <coughs> this uh, illustration applies very fittingly to, to what farmers and business people need to do. They need to begin to think in terms of individual action, but be willing to give up a little individual freedom for the moment in order that they may gain group, group strength to gain the goals that they see. In other words, they would be somewhat like the pioneers uh, going across the prairie yeah. by grouping themselves together. This is right. And uh, someone has said, and I think this is a very good statement, that you don't predict the future, you invent the future. And as we have invented uh, tractors and uh, combines, we would also need to invent group structures. We need to have, in, and I think this is what NFO is probably trying to do, is to develop a marketing structure to deal with mass production. Reverend Mueller, our time is drawing to a close. We appreciate having uh, you with us today on U.S. Farm Report. I, uh, to the people in the audience, I would uh, like to have you investigate further the NFO and its program. I think when you check into the NFO, you'll realize that many of the principles that Reverend Mueller set out today apply to the NFO, and the NFO has, uh, to a degree, uh, followed many of these principles in setting up the organization and structure that would put farmers in a stronger bargaining position so that they could correct some of the inequities that are in rural America today. U.S. Farm Report has presented Responsible Action with special guest the Reverend E.W. Mueller, a staff member of the Department of Church and Community Planning, Lutheran Council in the United States of America, Chicago. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's wealth. The National Farmers Organization represents new thinking and a new generation of farmers, for the farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity. Tune in again next week at this same time for another edition of U.S. Farm Report, sponsored by members of the National Farmers Organization in this local TV viewing area.